It is Friday, January 24th, 2020. It is 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and so you know what time it is. It's time for a little bit of coin metal. And my deepest apologies, I'd like to start off with my deepest apologies to all of you listeners out there who have been missing me. Um, Yeah, I was having a lot of computer difficulties, as those of you who listen to the show are well aware. And, uh, yeah, I was having some hardware difficulties, and they all stemmed from an errant PSU. And uh, for those of you who do not know your computer language, that is power supply unit. It's the little thing in the back of your desktop that you plug one end of the cord in to plug into the wall. And you plug the other end into the wall. That that thing that you plug the other end into, not the wall, right? That's your power supply unit. Anyway, so I had this cheesy old power supply unit in my desktop and I'm like pushing it to do like 8 billion things. I got two browsers open. I got 30 tabs in each browser open. I'm just really pushing the shit out of this motherboard and the processor and all that. And uh, so it was causing some glitches. It's causing some issues. Um, what I was wholly unaware of, though, was the difference in the in just like the uptake. I mean, like literally startup on this thing is completely minimal. It's like maybe five seconds tops. And so... You know, from the point where you you press the power button on to when it's fully posted and ready for you to sign in, it's like one, two, three, four, five, bam, it's ready to go. And so anyway, I, that that was a product of my intention, but nonetheless, it it was one of those things where it's like I just I had no idea how much it would improve the uh, the performance of the computer. And, you know, I got really lucky. I got a really good friend out there. One of these days, one of these days, we're going to talk about it sometime, but not necessarily right now. Anyway, um, I had a really good friend out there help me out, and, uh, yeah, he he hooked me up with a power supply. I mean, because, like, I was in one of those positions, and those of you who trade crypto, y- y- you know, there, there's some of those times when it's like, you really don't want to change any of your current positions, but you need money now, or like you need money in a couple days, or you need some money in, in the foreseeable future, right? You don't have the liquidity available, and you, you got to loosen up some funds, and it, it's evaluating exactly where to take it from, you know? But, you know, I, I don't I don't typically take profit, you know, I'm, and again, that's, that's one of those things that makes me one of the lamest traders on the planet is that... I always keep my money rolling, and uh, that, that's just the way I do it. You know, it, it's it's great loss, great reward kind of thing, all or nothing. And uh, I, I feel that it will be rewarded, though. You know, I have, I have faith that in the longer run, the necessity for crypto to be free and to be in as many stakeholders' hands as possible is going to be there. And so, the, and it's going to far ex, far exceed the desire or need to keep huge bureaucracies operational. You know, especially when those uh, when those bureaucracies in the end only uh, only end up being self serving. You know, and they they don't necessarily serve our interests. Anyway, <clears throat> it was a very painful get your ass kicked at Jiu Jitsu Friday. Pain. I'm still feeling it. God damn. And it was funny because we weren't even really sparring. It was this uh, weird game we were playing, and we only played it for a little bit, and I think it was because I got injured so quickly. Um, but we were supposedly trying to retain the the octopi, basically, between our feet. And, uh, and our opponent was trying to seize control of the octopi by foot. Now, they couldn't grab the, um, the octopi with their hands, they could only grab it with their feet. And so I, I got in this weird position where I was trying to keep my opponent from touching the, getting control of the octopi again. And um, he like, he leaned over towards me, you know, like over my shoulder kind of thing. And uh, I had my left leg extended and it, I kind of like, I rolled back and like, like forced open my my hips or something man and I felt this pop and it's like right in my 
right in my gluteus area. And so I'm like, oh, fuck, man, I just popped a hamstring or some shit. And so, uh, yeah, that, that made me a little tentative. And basically anything that challenged my hamstrings is making me feel really dodgy and, and in pain. Um, but nonetheless, I, I thought about not doing it, but there was a 15-minute um, sparring session at the end that, they were, that we were doing. And, you know, I, I managed to limp my way through the rest of the class... Um, but when we got to that, um, the sparring, of course, I happened to be paired up against one of the highest ranking gentlemen in the room, which is fine by me. I, I really do need the challenge. And and he did tap me viciously multiple times, but I did not lose my composure and I kept it pretty much all the way down to the point where I had to tap. There was only one of the taps that, that he like he really had to go vicious on and um, and it was it was because of the way that he got the uh, the arm bar on me, the angle that he he got it from. There really isn't a slow like way into it, and so you know I I felt I felt pretty good about the fact that the stuff that he was getting me on he act, he was like working me towards you know it wasn't stuff that that you know just like complete accident or just lazy shit you know it was, it was stuff that he was working for. And so, you know, it was it was good on him, and I guess good on me because I wasn't going, I wasn't getting caught in as much of it as I as I probably would have, say six six months to a year ago. Um, but uh, yeah, so I was mostly trying to pace myself, and, and you guys know that's kind of an issue for me, is because I want to get it done, I want to close the gap and get it done, and and so even injured. I managed to uh, only get tapped. I think I think I got tapped like four, maybe three, maybe four times, and um, they they were all really good taps. And, and like I said, I, I don't feel bad about the taps. It was the fact that I kept getting caught on on one aspect of it, and it was mostly a triangle setup that he was doing. And I stuffed it a couple times, and I think I stuffed it the last time, and I made him hold it. In, in a really uncomfortable position and he couldn't do anything with it from there and so he had to disengage and readjust and so I used that opportunity to get out of it and it, it, it worked out pretty good it worked out pretty good and I think I might have impre- impressed my at least one of my instructors in the way that I was rolling but I'm not sure <laughs> It seems like we've been we've been rolling a lot lately you know we've been putting in a lot of rounds lately. And I'm sure at least part of that is due to the fact that we do have a competition coming up. And so those that are competing would need the need and want the additional mat time to prepare, you know. And so anyway, but the, it, it seems like, you know, my my conditioning is getting challenged more than anything, of course. And uh, although I did not cardio tap today. And, um, and so uh, at the end... The I I couldn't I couldn't finish, but it wasn't because I was having cardio issues. It was because I kept doing things that were aggravating my hip. It's like, dude, I'm I'm already hurt. I may have pulled a hamstring here. I really don't need to continue to hurt it. Cause you know it's like I, I would get pushed over by this guy, and I and I think I had like two and a half minutes left out of fifteen. We were just doing a, a continuous fifteen minute round. And like I said, I managed to make it that far, but it was with a lot of pain. I mean, with a lot of pain. You know, he pushed me over on my side, and of course, I'd land right on the hip that's hurt. Or, you know, I I tried to stack him in, in one of the tri- times that I was trying to escape a triangle. And, uh, of course, that was painful because, you know, I got, my, I got his weight on my hamstring, the one that's hurt. And so, you know, I wasn't performing at 100%, but nonetheless, I was just trying to stay alive. You know, I figured if you can't roll while you're tired and or injured, when can you roll? You know, I mean, especially when you're up at my age, you're going to be one of those two. You're either going to be tired or you're going to be injured. And so the, the excuse that you don't feel like it or whatever, yeah, stuff that up your ass, man. Just, just stuff it, you know. 
grab the keys, get in the fucking car, grab your, you know, grab your gi, grab, grab your keys, get your ass to the gym and do it. And, and that's pretty much what I tell myself when I'm, when I'm feeling that, oh, I don't think I want to do it today. I'm feeling hurt. I'm feeling tired. I don't feel like it. You know, it's real easy to give in to that voice, man. It's comforting, you know? You, you gave up. I, I gave in to it all the times before I actually walked into jujitsu, you know? And when I started getting the benefit of it, and started to understand the benefit of doing it, uh, that that voice got a lot smaller in my head. It's like, you know, I would start to hear it, and it's like, what, are you fucking crazy? No, no, get your ass up, let's go. <laughs> you know, I mean, I like choking people. I like, I, I don't mind when people are choking me. I like trying to get out of that situation. You know, and, and when they get me down to it, I got to pay attention to exactly how they got me down to it so I can try and prevent it next time around. You know, and without going, you don't get that exposure. You don't learn those lessons. So get your ass up and go. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw down with our first dance. And of course, you know, we're going to go with body count. And I, I cannot believe how much better this is running right now. I feel so thankful to my friend, and I hope he's listening. So you can hear it. You know what? As a matter of fact, I know a song that he really, 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 really likes. And so I'm going to play that one first. And so here, let's get to it. And so here it is. Rio Grande Blood by Ministry. First dance here on Coin Metal. And that was Anthrax with Be All, End All. Yeah. I gotta get some, like, noise limiter or something so that it, it, like, it plays all of the songs in the background at a continuous level. Because there, there's something about it, man. I mean, it, it, there's something about which year an album was made or who made an album which makes the difference between what volume it was it was recorded at, you know? And so it's like, when it plays back, you'll have one that plays back at a 5 and one that plays back at a 10 at the same volume setting because there's that much differential bet <laughs> between, you know? Anyway, <clears throat> as far as what we're going to get into today, <sighs> it seems that... Uh, there was a meeting recently, uh, Davos, <clears throat> and uh, of course they're going to weigh in on cryptocurrency, and I think they make the same mistake that they've always made about cryptocurrency, and they probably did throughout this entire time at Davos, is the assumption that it is something for them to define for the rest of us. And I find it very sad because we're so far down the line with this game. You know, they really should be looking at a district by district basis and trying to determine exactly which districts would yield the most amount of fucking Bitcoin if miners were to be there and like encourage people to mine there. You know, if, if national governments were that intelligent, that is exactly what they would be doing. Unfortunately, I don't think the American, uh, the U.S. government is that smart, and it doesn't seem like a lot of others are either. <sighs> anyway, so we got this thing, it's on Barron's, <laughs> Barron's.com. Bitcoin just made the big time, the Davos crowd has signed on. No shit. They've been pumping money back and forth this entire time, man. Whenever you see one of those multi-million dollar transactions going from unidentified wallet to unidentified wallet, chances are uh, there there's just as good a chance anyway that that transfer could be happening between one rich person to another rich person as it could be from one exchange to another. And chances are it, it is probably one rich person to another. Of course, they won't tell you how to do that. No, no, that's that's what my job is. Anyway, continuing on. Cryptocurrency is being embraced by the Davos set, and some Bitcoin fans are excited. Not me. 
the World Economic Forum said on Friday that it is putting together a consortium made up of public and private sector leaders to write guidelines for cryptocurrency governance. The announcement was light on specifics, but it signified that the people who keep watch over the traditional banking system, central bankers in particular, are willing to be associated with digital assets and even promote them. Yeah, no shit. It allows them to take a volume of of money that they've got in their books, whether it's theirs or not, collateralize it on another set of books, i.e. a block turn, and yeah, anyway, continuing on. Entrepreneurs in the industry have expressed frustration about how widely gov- governance standards for cryptocurrencies vary throughout the world. Yeah, that's too fucking bad, entrepreneurs. The consortium will try to bring together, to bring order to this, quote, fragmented regulatory system. The announcement said, yeah, you can go fuck yourself. It doesn't matter what regulatory body you set up or what regulatory system you set up. We're not under any obligation to follow your shit. Fuck you. The price of Bitcoin rose after the announcement, which came just after noon, your Central European time, or 6 a.m. Eastern time. Bitcoin rose to about $8,400 from $8,200 over the next hour. It was trading at $8,455 in early afternoon in New York. Well, cryptocurrency's initial appeal was that it operated outside of the world's ordinary financial infrastructure in a rebuke to the economic and political systems. Many investors think that its price is dependent on it being accepted more widely, including by the gatekeepers of the systems. No, it isn't. It has absolutely nothing to do with that. It's your acceptance. You're the fucking market. It doesn't matter if one of these buttfuckers is in between me and you. You are the market. You have the option of discluding those buttfuckers from taking any money from me or you in our commerce with one another. Why would you want to reintroduce buttfuckers to your commerce? Continuing on. Bill Miller, a famous value investor who bought the digital currency before it surged in 2017, has said that Bitcoin has been on a, quote, march to respectability that should gradually benefit its price. On Friday, he told Barron's that the Davos announcement is part of this process. No, it isn't. It's, it has absolutely nothing to do with the fucking announcement. Quote, And mind you, this is a central banker sailing this shit. This announcement is a further indication that the economic elites are no longer ignoring the innovation behind cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology, said Mark Williams, a Boston University professor who teaches about fintech. Uh, Sounds like he's teaching about something he he knows absolutely nothing about. Continuing on. It's important to note that digital currency today encompasses a lot more than Bitcoin and other decentralized coins, although they still make up the vast majority of all projects. The term also refers to currencies being developed by central banks themselves, as well as ones expected to be governed by corporations such as Facebook's Libra. David Marcus, head of the Libra project, was one of the people quoted in the announcement about the consortium. His quote wasn't particularly illuminating. He said, quote, We welcome the dialogue, but it is incrementally positive for both the project and cryptocurrencies in general that Libra was mentioned. No, it was just positive for Libra. The currency has faced major pushback from governmental le- government leaders in the U.S. and elsewhere. It isn't clear if Marcus or, other, or another Facebook representative will be part of the consortium. Government leaders had, been, uh, had previously cr- seen cryptocurrencies mainly as a way for criminals and political dissidents to move money around the world without being detected. Friday's news shows that leaders now see these currencies as tools for financial inclusion. Poor people without money in a bank could use them to transact without paying high fees. Uh, No, 
the fact of the matter is we don't need banks anymore to transact for very very high uh, very very low fees I mean we could pay high fees if we really wanted to but anyway there's some comments on here um, Miles Dudley says when the sheriff rides into town it's not necessarily good news for the gunslingers um, Miles here's the thing it doesn't matter how many fucking guns the sheriff has he is completely defenseless in the face of the world market. If he decides that he wants to point his gun at too many people, the people that are associated with the people he pointed a gun at will go to other places to do their business. And that includes making their own currencies to transact in. And the world will find this out sooner or fucking later. I mean, I, I've been trying to communicate to it to you all for about five years now. And some of you have been smart enough to listen to me. Some. Anyway, continuing on. Irishman Connor says, on the, east, uh, on the coast of El Salvador, Bitcoin is becoming the standard. Interesting. Um, Irishman Connor says, uh, whatever the F that means. Um, <clears throat> what I think it means is that people understand that they're being kind of coerced into using cryptocurrencies, but not in in a um, in the same way that they would have been coerced into using them before. I mean, basically, the the legs of the financial system that they've been operating within are basically being kicked out from under them. You know, and this is the problem with discluding too much of the market from being able to provide feedback and provide input and this is something this is a process that's been going on for like the last oh I don't know century or so where the bankers basically control everything and they control everything because they are the issuers and circulators of much of the monetary value that we all depend on to do things like put electricity in the house and fucking food in the refrigerator And so we're, we've been kind of like bent over this barrel for a little while where we we suffer the exchange rate that they are willing to give to us. And they've been put in that position by our governments. Bitcoin was literally the people yanking those reins back and saying, no, I am going to assume responsibility over my monetary value and I am going to define how that monetary value is created and I am going to define by the rules of my network who may participate in it. And it's mine. And the government can go fuck itself. And it can go fuck itself because there's no... I, I don't have a gun in my hand saying, you have to use this. You know, that's that's you. That's on you. When If you decide, hey, you know what? That coin over there looks good. I like its, its hash rate. I like its rules on its network. I want to dedicate electricity, hardware, and bandwidth to that network. And, and the integrity of that coin. And I want to try and make some coin in the process. That that right's been handed to you by Satoshi Nakamoto with this whole Bitcoin thing. And the fact that it's open source means we can scalp all of it and rename it and put it back out again. And this is a reality that I, I think that uh, that these people in, in that go to these meetings like Davos, they just don't understand about cryptocurrencies. I mean, they, they've literally been changed from the one guy in the room with the gun to just a guy in a room with a bunch of guys that have guns too. You know, just another guy with a gun. <laughs> I mean, sure, it's got power, and you, you can listen to it, but you're just as capable of pulling your gun out and saying, fuck you, no, I'm not going to. Your rules suck, I don't want to listen to you. I want to go play my own game. And we have yet to see the chaos that is going to bring 
and I don't believe any regulation or regulatory framework or anything like that is going to save us from it. You know, we've we've seen a few rounds of it here in cryptocurrency, and ultimately, what what defines whether or not a process, a a coin or a project continues is whether or not the people that were developing it are still behind it, whether the people that believed in it enough to invest in it and to dedicate hardware to giving it a network are still invested in it. That's it. And with that being the, the how should I say it, the barrier of entry is your willingness to be a participant. Again, there isn't anything in the world that these people can say to you that will make it so you won't or can't do it. You know, if you're going to be connected to the internet, you, you could be hashing the hashes for a network. <laughs> and that's it. You know, and, and again, so the, when the, the bar is lowered that low, you know, the idea of having to defer to the opinion of a central banker is, it, it's completely pointless. You might as well be asking your next door neighbor, hey, can I have permission to participate on the Bitcoin network? Because Davos, the central bankers at Davos have as much control over what you're going to do with your hardware as your next door neighbor does. Actually, your next door neighbor probably has even more control because if he doesn't like all the noise, he can make a complaint and all that other shit. But, you know, that's a responsibility that you have with your neighbor and a relationship that you have with your neighbor. But, yeah, so when you when you conceptualize these facts about cryptocurrency... You know the idea that that their authority means anything is it's it's complete bullshit. It's fiction. It's an illusion. You know they only have deference because you've given them deference, and, and you personally didn't. Somebody else gave them different deference, and you said, "Okay, I'll, I'll just go along with that." <clears throat> and, and in a time when you could do that. And have it not really cost you anything. That's certainly a, a, a normal perspective to take. But we are not in that fucking world anymore, Dorothy. We are not in Kansas anymore. You know, and that means that we're being placed in a position where we, you, me, guy next door, are being put in a position where we we have to say to ourselves, where is the best position for my monetary value, my monetary value to be invested. Which coin should I give my fealty to? Which coin should I dedicate hardware, electricity, and bandwidth to? Which coin should I write code for? And that's a whole different discussion than which coin can I participate in, master? You're not in that position anymore. And, and, you know, it it was a good position to be in when you didn't really have to think about it. And like I said, it didn't really cost you much either way. But it's costing you more and more every day. And before, you really didn't have a choice in the matter. But you do now. Let's see what else is going on with this whole Davos thing. Let's see here. Hmm. I love it. Here we go. This is a different perspective. And uh, this is on uh, CryptoNews.com. Davos experts. Central banks focus on crypto due to fear of exclusion. (laughs) They see the kids picking up the ball and walking away. They want to get back in. And uh, so this was authored by um, Jaroslaw Adamowski. Um, my apologies if I mispronounced it, but I'm just going to assume penis unless I can figure out otherwise. Let's see here. Yes, penis. And uh, yeah, this is authored uh, January 24th, 2020. Continuing on. European Commission executives have conceded that there is a pressing need for digital alternatives to conventional currency, but... Continue to condemn cryptocurrencies as highly speculative. In a panel session entitled Creating a Credible and Trusted Digital Currency, held at the World Economic Forum in Davos on Thursday, 
Valdis Dombrovskis, yeah, Dombrovskis, um, executive vice president of the European Commission, stated that governments must quote issue warnings to investors on the highly speculative nature of cryptocurrencies. However, Dombrov- Dombrovskis conceded that the that Brussels also recognizes. There, there are now financial, quote, needs that are unaddressed, including fast, convenient, and cheap cross-border payments. The expert panel agreed that cryptocurrencies could help bring global small businesses into the international financial system, but claimed that public institutions still mistrust crypto-based finance. Nonetheless, central banks around the world are increasingly showing interest, an indication that they fear being left out of the emerging crypto sector. Dombrovskis opined, quote, It's clear that if the European banking system does not address this demand, someone else will. Uh, dude, that, that fucking ship has sailed. Okay, that, that sailed back in 2009. <laughs> and let's see, uh, Thurman... Shemagar Tanam Sorry about that. Uh, Chairman of the Monetary Authority of Singapore, MAS, stated, quote, We should ask ourselves what the real use cases are and where we could add value. You can't. Fuck you. Go away. Shemagar named three use cases. Number one, firstly, cross-border payments especially for people making small-scale payments, such as migrant workers. Second, the MS, MAS chief mentioned financial inclusion, saying that fintech is, quote, broadening access. And thirdly, Shamanimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarnimarn
Because as soon as you do, they're going to say to you, okay, well, in order for us to trust you, you're going to have to run these BIPs and you're going to have to use this hardware and you're going to have to go to, to this regulatory entity and get fully licensed and qualified and regulated and certified and fuck you! All of those things are going to introduce expenses to you that do not currently exist and and do not add any fucking value to anybody with regard to cryptocurrency. And in the end, they will end up losing out to shit like BitConnect and Dogecoin because it's way it'll be way more expensive to deal with people that have to deal with in that system. Again, the licensure, the insurance, the certification, the registration, all of the monitoring that you need to do, all of the record keeping that you have to do that you do not currently have to do, all introduces exogenous costs that aren't a product of your operations. They aren't intrinsic to your operations. So the idea that everybody is going to be playing according to those same rules is fucking silly. And the idea that doing so, trying to introduce such a regulatory framework on a system that you're trying to, quote, unquote, produce inclusion or enhance inclusion, it, it's, it's a fucking bald-faced lie. I mean, you're basically just lying to people, man. You're you're like you got a you got a hand out extended, like you're gonna shake your hand, you know. In the other hand, you got a fucking knife, and you're waiting for somebody to get close enough to touch your hand. You're gonna reach out and grab them by the wrist, pull them close, and then stab them right in the gut or in the back, one of the two. <laughs> but I mean, really, that's the whole intent. That's that. That's pretty much the way they play. That's the way they played over cable. That's why you've got. Uh, the entire planet's got like maybe six service providers with regard to cable. You know, internet, same thing. Telecom service, same thing. They just winnowed everybody out, all the competition out by playing greasy and loose with your governments. And they drop regulations that they know you can't possibly match, but they're fully capable of matching. And even then, they cheat on them. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the idea that, I mean, you could have cheated and got away with it. You know, millions of you, if you had cheated, would have gotten away with it because there's no possible way your government could have enforced on all of you. But AT&T does it. Well, there's no possible way your government can go against them because they're everywhere and they're, in this, they're, they're running shit for them too. You know, they're running hardware for the government. And so if they, if they attack AT&T, well, you know, all those cushy contract deals they get with AT&T go away. And the ability to spy on you as easily as they do goes away. So, you know, there's tit for tat, quid pro quo, you know. And that's one of the reasons why they really fear cryptocurrencies. Because all of those systems are dependent upon fiat currencies that the banks control the supply of. And every time somebody like you or me issues a new cryptocurrency out there to the world and gives everybody the option to jump on in, it creates competition for them. And the cost to do so is so fucking minimal. I mean, really, if you, if you guys had been around for the first alt bloom, you saw it take place. People that didn't have jack shit, but the ability to code a little bit more than a fucking website... We're getting together with other people on social media that were just as competent and launching coins, some of which still exist to this very day. Anyway, continuing on, there's just a teeny tiny bit left here. Meanwhile, today at the World Economic Forum announced the Global Consortium for Digital Currency Governance, which aims to bring together leading companies which won't do them any good. Financial institutions, again, won't do them any good. Government representatives, won't do them any good. Technical experts, might give them some sort of insight. Academics, which won't do them any good. Um, international organizations, which probably won't help. NGOs and members of the forum's communities on a global level. This consortium will focus on solutions for a fragmented regulatory system. Yeah, the solution is to just fuck off. It's not your shit to regulate. Continuing on, quote, Governance is the core pillar of any form of digital... 
<laughs> uh, let me read it again because that it's just too funny. Quote. Governance is the core pillar of any form of digital currency, said Mark Carney, gov- um, governor of the Bank of England. Quote, it's critical that any framework on digital currency ensures security, efficiency, and legitimacy of payments while ensuring fair and open competition. Yeah, again, a bunch of fucking crack smokers talking about meth. <laughs> you know, something they, they probably know absolutely nothing about. And it's really, really sad because these people are just as capable of learning about it as you are. And again, they're probably just reading articles like this and assuming their authority and that somehow it extends to the crypto space. The only place it can ever is where it interfaces with fiat. That's the only place it can touch this shit. And, of course, if they manage to ever launch a CBDC or a government-based coin, that would be a point where they would control it, too. And I guess that's one of the things they keep missing, is that the reason why Bitcoin exists is because enough of us said, we don't trust the banking system that you have. We are going to create a new currency, and we are going to dedicate our own electricity and bandwidth to it, And we're going to see if we can do what you do for us without you. And we were successful. We were successful back in 2008, 2009, 2010. It didn't have a price in dollars until I think... It was was either late 2010 or early 2011. No, it's late 2010, the pizza event. That was like the official de facto determining exchange rate between... Bitcoin and US dollars was that one retail exchange and from what I understand that was actually international too somebody somewhere else it was either interstate or international where somebody else was willing to pay for the the pizza in exchange for Bitcoin being sent to them you know this just denotes that the need for these people is gone the perceived need for them still exists. In the longer term, they are going to serve as one of two things. They're going to be mining pool operators. <laughs> you know, the, the, they're offering that, that service to their, their locality through their, the uh, bank nodes. You know, that they'll be, they'll be operating a node there that you can mine through. And again, that'll be something that if you want to, you can do that. But what, what really needs to happen here and it's something that we're not seeing quite yet, is that banks have to divorce themselves from governments. Because, in fact, government policy and the incestuous relationship that they have in order to maintain the, the kind of effect over it that they currently, sh- they currently have, enjoy, the fact of the matter is, is that it's limiting them in the ways that they can serve us. And it's because they're transacting under the contract and and under the description of the fiat currency of the government that they are serving. You know, so like at one point, the U.S. dollar was associated with gold and there still is some sort of loose basis by which it's associated with gold, but... That's that's just one factor of it, and because it is a factor of it, you have to main you have to maintain this as a, a way of demonstrating your your how should I say your integrity or your your people's ability to trust in you that you can make good on your payments, and I'm sure there's a word for that that's just escaping me at this moment, but that. That necessity has been, you know, it, it needs to exist because you need to, you need something like that for commerce. And, and again, this is where Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies have changed the rules of the game because it's no longer just the banks that are able to dictate to us. It's no longer just governments that can dictate to us. It's entities that we ourselves can involve ourselves in and give direct input. 
There's no more of this shit that, you know, I have to use a currency that I can't be a part of. I mean, really, how fun is that? It's like you have to play this game with your arm tied behind your back and you have to do it on your knees because that's the rules of the game. The rest of us, you know, the, the people that are, have got licenses and stuff, they can fly around, they can jump, they can, they can you know, grab with things with both hands and stuff. But you have to have one arm tied behind your back and you have to do it on your knees and you have to grab everything with your mouth. And you have to survive doing that, you know, until you can be one of them. And then maybe we'll give you an arm and maybe we'll let you walk upright. Oh, what, what, how fun would that be? Would you would you want to play a game like that? Where a certain percentage of the other team you know, gets to stand upright and... Or actually, the whole team gets to stand upright while you got to play against them on your knees with one arm tied behind your back? If you're on a, if you're on a playground, and and there was a, a, a several groups of kids playing several different games, and this one game it's got the most popular people on the entire in the entire school, most popular kids in the entire class is there, and they get to they get to stand upright, but the other team, the team that opposes them, has to play on their knees with one arm tied behind their back. Now, I don't give a fuck how popular they are. The fact that there are other games, ones that I don't have to play on my knees with one arm tied behind my back, means that I'm going to play with those kids. I'm not going to play with these kids that are forcing me to play at a distinct disadvantage without any of the gifts I've been endowed with, without any capabilities that I've been endowed with. Just so that they can continually win. Well, that that's not a that's not a fun game. Fuck that game. Take your ball to another court. Play with some other kids that do not have that that set of rules. Well, before you didn't have that choice with regard to currency, and now you do. And these people are trying to figure out how they get that rule set extended over to Bitcoin. How they get it extended over Doge or Digibyte. Or Monero. And the only way they'll ever be successful at it is if you let them. Let's go ahead and throw it back down into some music. Let's see. We played some Anthrax last time, so... I'm feeling the need for a little bit of clutch here. A little bit of space grass. Here on Coin Metal. And that was Meshuggah with Closed Eye Visuals. And so, you know, I've been uh, making a habit of going over to CoinWars.com and uh, checking out the mining profitability on coins. And uh, there's some really surprising stuff going on here. You know, I've uh, I've been entertaining the idea of getting back into mining. And uh, I... I I'm getting the impression that, uh, you know, it's uh, the the potential for it is out there. The profitability is certainly out there. Um, but I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at this list, and currently, the last coin that reflects any kind of profitability for mining is Litecoin, and um, I guess Cannabis Coin is right at zero, according to this. Uh, and there are several coins below that, but anyway, uh, Bitcoin is is actually number nine, and uh, it's only a dollar seventy six. Um, with uh, I guess uh, the total number is seven forty nine, and that's paying five dollars and seventy two cents for the electricity, and you got a profitability of one dollar and seventy six cents. Now that's on Bitcoin. However, if you go up to the top, the first one is Ethereum Classic right now at $4.90 because you spend $6.70 burning hashes and you make, uh, let's see here, what is that? Uh, $1 for electric, at uh, I guess $1.80 for electricity. And so uh, your profitability on that is pretty good at $4.90. 
And Verge was number one the last time I checked, but it's currently number four. So that gives you any kind of indication. <clears throat> but it's still significantly more profitable than mining Bitcoin, which I, I find that fucking entertaining. Is all I'll get out because I mean it's it's literally twice as profitable to mine Verge right now than it is to mine Bitcoin. Uh, that's just that's hilarious to me. Anyway, back to our stories of the day. And uh let's see, I had a little bit of a little bit of an issue trying to figure out exactly where to go. And uh let's see here, I was digging around a little bit and I saw this one and I thought it was interesting enough to communicate on the show at least. And uh this is on Cointelegraph.com. And it's by Andrei Shevchenko. So yes, penis. And uh, this is authored approximately nine hours ago. Elon Musk reveals his true opinion on Bitcoin and crypto. After a long and cryptic series of tweets on Bitcoin, SpaceX, and Tesla, CEO Elon Musk elaborated his stance on cryptocurrencies in a January 20th podcast. Noting that he's, quote, neither here nor there on Bitcoin, Musk focused on its use for illegal transactions. The billionaire has recently been in the spotlight for several short and cryptic tweets related to cryptocurrency. On January 10th, he published a tweet saying, quote, Bitcoin is not my safe word. This follows an equally cryptic tweet from April 2019 saying, Cryptocurrency is my safe word. But while they were generally considered to be jokes, especially in light of previous tweets where he pledged to take, quote, Tesla private at $420, Musk's early, er, early history is deeply tied with the financial technology industry. In 1999, Elon Musk founded X.com, an online bank that, though later, uh, I'm sorry, through, through later mergers became PayPal, he mentioned the company in the podcast, noting, quote, if PayPal had executed the plan that I wanted to execute on, I think it would probably be the most valuable company in the world. The interviewers then asked what Musk thought about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies given their spiritual similarity to X.com. Musk replied that he's, quote, neither here nor there on Bitcoin. While referring to Satoshi's white paper as pretty clever, he prefaced by saying that his stance on cryptocurrencies, quote, gets the crypto people very angry. He continued, quote, There are transactions that are not within the bounds of the law. There are obviously many laws in different countries and, normally, cash is used for those transactions. But in order for illegal transactions to to occur, the cash must also be used for legal transactions. You need an illegal to legal bridge. That's where crypto comes in. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Musk noted that cash is increasingly harder to use, but any alternative would have to be usable for both legal and illegal purposes, as, quote, it doesn't count otherwise. Even though he may not be entirely sold on cryptocurrencies, Musk sees a clear purpose for them. Quote, you must have a legal to illegal bridge. So, where I see crypto is effectively a replacement for cash. I do not see crypto being the primary database for transactions. Despite the negative connotation from being used for illegal purposes, he emphasized that he's not being, quote, judgmental about crypto. In Musk's view, the government's overreach in certain aspects. Quote, I think there are a lot of things that are illegal that shouldn't be illegal. I think that sometimes governments just have too many laws about the missions that they should have and shouldn't have so many things that are illegal. Goddamn right. While not a full endorsement, Musk is not exactly opposite to cryptocurrencies. In an early part, earlier part of the interview, he said that, quote, banks are in trouble, 
though he primarily referred to competitors such as Stripe. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. I agree with that wholeheartedly. I think the uh, mistake that most people make is that they believe that because it's illegal that it's supposedly morally wrong. Or there's, there's some reason why it's wrong other than the government just came along someday and said, oh gosh, people are making money doing that. We better figure out some way to tax it. I mean, we, we better figure out a way to steal some of that money. I mean, literally, that's what that's what it's tantamount to with regard to cryptocurrencies. Government's just hovering around saying, oh gosh, how are people making money that we're not getting a cut of? We better get a cut of that. And when you read the regulations, that's pretty fucking clear. It's like they want to regulate it just so that they can pay for people to regulate it. There's no, there's no like value or safety added here. And I, I think the biggest problem with the market as it exists today is the assumption that it does. And the recognition by other players that it doesn't. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> I, I mean, and, and in fact, they use the, the, the regulatory frameworks that are already available in their schemes. They help design the schemes so that they can get away with them for a certain duration of time and as long as they play within those time frames they're cool but once they exceed them those are basically like like defined trust limitations it's like we'll trust you until you've issued out this much liquidity or or the the relative value of like 10 billion dollars worth of liquidity and then we're going to have to start paying attention to you because uh you're potentially going to risk too many people's fortune should you fuck up and or steal their money <laughs> and that that's a that seems on its face at least to be a good thing the problem is this is that the government can't account for your actual experience with these entities you know whether we're talking about a bank or you know some guy that you met in an alleyway the government can't, it doesn't have any control over whether or not that bank is actually going to issue you a loan. They can give you guidelines. I mean, they can give the bank guidelines to go by, but the, the bank is a, is a private entity and is free to make the decision. You know, this guy's credit looks kind of shady, so I don't, I don't think we're going to extend to him that loan. This guy's of poor health. I, I don't think we're going to extend it to, to him that loan because I, I don't think it's he's going to fulfill, and I don't think that he's going to make it worth it to us. But there are people out there who don't really give a shit if they make a return on it. There are people out there that, if it were possible to just give some money to other people, they would. But instead of, of having the option of giving the money to whom they want to give the money to, they've got these uh, these regulatory frameworks that tell them how they can give the money. You know, give the money to the government, and then the government will give the money to the other people. But you know, the government will get a cut of it, of course. And whether or not the entities that you're trying to assist get a sufficient amount of that money is, well, it's n of nobody's real concern, right? See, that's that's where cryptocurrencies are different. Because you don't have to ask somebody's permission. They, the, the entity that you intend to benefit, they just have to have a receive address. And I, I've proven this to myself, and uh, it was rather in, in, inadvertent um you know, a while ago, I was in an IRC chat room, and I was marshalling a, a significant amount of verge, um, and I had accumulated it through people giving tips and stuff like that, and so <clears throat> I thought about it, I'm, I'm like, well, you know, this guy was telling me he's, he's having some trouble or something, no, it wasn't that, I gave him, I just gave him like, I think it was like 50,000 of them or $50,000 worth or I, I don't even know what the the amount of it was but I mean at the at the time that I gave it the verge was worth like maybe 16 satoshis 
right? So, I mean, it, it, it wasn't a whole lot, but I mean, I gave him like 500,000 of them. And then at one point, Verge was, was worth like 20 cents, you know, when it shot up to over 2,000 Satoshis and he cashed out. And at the time he cashed out, the only reason he cashed out is he managed, he was rummaging around shit to sell because he couldn't pay his fucking rent. And he finds this fucking thumb drive that's got a wallet on it that has this 500,000 verge in it. So he sweeps the wallet into his, into his exchange account <clears throat> or into a live wallet rather and then, and then puts it on his exchange account, cashes it out Suddenly he's got rent money and now he's got a uh, like I think it was like twenty or thirty thousand dollars or some outrageous amount of fucking money. Like when I gave it to him, it was like you know seventy bucks maybe maybe. And yet when he cashed it out, it's worth over fifty thousand dollars or some shit like that. And that changed his life. That, that got him some rent for a significant period of time. You know, now, think about that. He's on the verge of getting kicked out on the fucking street. All of a sudden, now he's got rent. And he's got food money. And he's got clothing money. And he's got spending money. And from what I understand, he's he's now on his, his feet and, and not actually dependent on those funds anymore. But that, that made that kind, kind of difference... To somebody else. Now, if I had some tax guy and it re- reaching into my pocket and snatching out big chunks of that money, you know, regardless of what its current exchange rate was, then I, I don't have the option to just give him that money. And you know, maybe I, I was only able to give him a, a few thousand, you know, because I'm getting taxed, <laughs> you know. And so I, I don't have that. That's a government making that decision for me. You know, how much to give that guy. You know, they'll, they'll just like bleed him along long enough for him to develop a fucking opiate dependency or some shit like that. Fucking OD in his, in his Section 8 housing on his food stamps. <sighs> it's fucking ridiculous. No. I, I gave him enough to fucking bump him up to tax brackets. That's what I did. And of course, I, I didn't do it with that intention in mind. But I am honored and glad that that was the result. I did that. And you did that out there in the market. With all that trading up and down of Verge. <laughs> so, I mean, that that's the kind of thing that we're, we're talking about with regard to values. You know, and these bankers talking in Davos, they're trying to elect themselves as the people who get to tell crypto what to do. And and that's just not how the world is going to work this... this it's not going to work that way. I, I understand it because I've been watching this shit for 10 years and all kinds of regulatory frameworks have been presented and tested and they never pass muster. The first report comes in on the impact of the of what they can exp- what exposure points they have to the market and they see those points dwindle although the activity within their borders doesn't seem to go down for some mysterious reason. And so they're like, "Oh, well shit, we're just cutting off our limbs here. We we better start figuring out a new way to negotiate with this." And and you can see it in the, in the language in that Davos report or that, that report on Davos that we read earlier, you, you can hear it in the words that they're using, that they don't have handles on this shit. And there are huge corporate entities already involved. So the idea that they get to push it around, like, you know, it's it's some some prize that they get to elect themselves to grab onto, that, that's gone. It, do, it doesn't exist anymore, if it ever did. You know, and that's really the question to ask yourself is, is how much control have they really had over the market? And I would say they had more before the existence of Bitcoin. But I, I think, you know, that the creation of Bitcoin, it, again, it, it wasn't something that, that just happened overnight. 
You know, there were people that wanted it before it existed. There were people that tried various ways to bring it into existence before it existed. It's just that Bitcoin happened to be the way it ex- it succeeded. And the difference is, is that most of those those attempts, they did not include enough entities. They didn't have enough interested parties to keep it in existence. By the, by the time that, that regulators were even looking at Bitcoin, it was already way too late. There was a global network going on, and people just like you and me got our miners plugged in, taxing the shit out of our GPUs. You know, when that, when that level of participation returns to crypto on the mining front, we're going to see an entirely different game. And I do say when. It's not an if, it's a when. Somebody is going to come along and they're going to come along with that mindset of of including as many people are willing to participate. And the fact that they are willing to participate alone is rewarded sufficiently to keep them interested. I believe that because that's possible within, within crypto, it's been demonstrated multiple times, because it is possible, it will happen again. And of course, there, there are currently existing multiple projects that, that exceed the, the existing regulatory frameworks in multiple ways. Verge and Monero and a, and a few others being them. You know, that they've already got inside them, in, intrinsic to their existence protections of the users a denial of the identification being associated or of any identification information being associated with your transactions of course I think they're going to try and bump that up with real ID you know that they're going to have some sort of global database (laughs) of of everybody's um, information and uh, that that'll be the way that they try and control things you know that your your real ID will be associated with your phone number or at least through your bank account that you're paying for your phone phone services for or with and you're going to have to find another way around that if you if you want to do transactions that nobody knows who you are and there, there there's still going to be ways to do it and that, and if there's ever threatened that, people will find a way around it. You know, it's like we, we talk about the um, the digital media market and how that's changing over time. And you know, all all of these uh, streaming channels that we're getting all of a sudden, like uh, Disney Plus and all those. You know that that was something that might have worked a little while ago but none of these sources provide enough access to enough media in and of themselves to be individually worth the seven dollars or whatever they are charging a month right well what made those possible what created the market for them was torrents and downloading you know, people downloading music and, and movies and shit off the internet for free. That's what created the market for it. You know, where you could sit there for 12 hours watching six seasons of a show. You know, that you would normally have to wait six years to see all of it. <laughs> um, you know, and that that's pretty convenient. And it's really interesting. But, you know, when the cost to do that is more than the electricity required for you to set up a server and a whole bunch of torrent seeds <laughs> and, and participate on, on a torrent network, you know, there, there's an incentive structure there. You know, there's an incentive balance. And, and the only reason the balance exists as it does is because, like, 90% of the market isn't, a, isn't aware of all of the options that exist. But I think that's changing. I think as more people are in, enable to afford 
the the six or seven different channels that they're they've been paying for every month for maybe a year or two they're looking at the bills for the end of the year and they're going dude we are going broke between the internet bill the cable bill all of these fucking services we're, we're going broke on all of it well wh- what are the other options i i want to watch the mandalorian you know what what are the other options Oh, what? I can torrent it? And not only can I torrent it, can I, I, I can get it 12 hours ahead of its normal release date if I get it via torrents? Well, hmm. Is, is it really worth it? I mean, you know, the, uh, there is the possibility that the FBI could break down my door and bust me for it, but at the same time, there's millions of people doing that. So, what's the likelihood that the FBI is going to bust down all of their doors? I mean, hey, who am I? I got nothing. I, I just got this this computer right here. So, you know, why not? And that idea is already out there. I wouldn't even fucking say it if I if I didn't think that the the vast majority of people out there think it at some point or another, especially if they're on the internet already. You know, you're always looking for ways to lower your cost profile to participate online and even to monetize as much of that use online as possible. And so I I think because those drives exist in us, that it it doesn't matter what the people at Davos says, it doesn't matter what your government says, eventually they are going to come around. And and like I said, you know, we're we're ten years into this for governments to be talking about cryptocurrency and, and and central bankers to be talking about cryptocurrency in the stance that they are, they're starting to understand their position in this and that no, they are not at the head of it. That they are having to participate with us on equal footing. And, it, and it's a precarious time for us because the fact of the matter is, is they don't have anything of value to offer us. And the only things that they can offer us subject us to a great deal of legal liability that we can just as easily avoid by not involving them at all. And that's the difference between needing a bank and not needing a bank to hold your digital monetary funds. Is because if they if they do if they're absolutely necessary in the process, you're necessitating this gateway by which participants in the game will be limited, and you will be taxed for the responsibility of some entity to control that. Now you know it is it does bear noting that we are year ten into this. There are 5,000 cryptocurrencies out there and they have all bloomed into existence and stayed live without the participation of a bank or a government. Without the permission of a bank or a government. They started that way and they still exist to this day. And the only difference between you and somebody who is currently participating on that level is that you haven't turned it on yet. <laughs> I mean, really think about that one. You know, if you can participate in the in the viability and integrity of the of the financial network that you're storing your monetary value in, if that were the only cause for you to have access to a global network of people that are that are using it just like you. Why wouldn't you do it? Especially if that is all it costs you. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down into some music. And there was some sixth playing in the background, but I think we already played some, so we're not going to double up on that. Hmm. You know, we haven't played any Metallica today. And I just managed to get Injustice for All for like the the fifth time. That's one of those albums, man. It just disappears. You've got it. You've had it in your your collection for a little while. You go to grab it again, and it's not fucking there. Somehow it disappears. I don't know what it is, but these things happen. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw down. And, uh, hmm. 
I want to go off of Injustice for All. And so I think Blackened, here we go, here on Coin Metal. Oh, I was going to let that roll, but can't do it, can't do it. Uh, that last one was Red Fang, uh, Behind the Light, off their latest album. Good stuff. I saw them in, in uh, concert with Clutch. And um, I gotta tell you, Clutch has only gotten better with age, I, I would say. that Although their energy was a bit more raw the first time that I saw them, but that was back in 1993. So, <laughs> a little bit of aging happened since then. So, a little culturing um, but still, I would have liked to have heard them play like a Space Grass or Escape from the Prison Planet, neither of which were on the list. Neither was a, sam- a samurai named Marcus, which, or a shogun, shogun named Marcus, rather. Um, yeah, that wasn't on the list either. I would have liked to have heard it. Uh, but yeah, as we come to the end of this show... One thing is certain, that we're not out of the woods yet with regard to this stuff. That we still have to go through this process on a high enough scale for people to really understand the level of power that they've been granted with cryptocurrency. It's not necessarily the the, mar- the number of the beast style market that's been envisioned for us for the last, what, 2,000 years? We've got a way out. We have options now. We didn't have those options before. And I believe that the only reason that we do have these options is because the game was just played too long. You know, they they had a limited window to get us over to a universal digital currency. And, and they may still be trying to do it, you know, with Bitcoin as the base or something like that. Um, but even if they do, we're not restricted to dealing with them. And because that can't really change about cryptocurrencies, I don't really see that reality being fulfilled. I believe that because there is enough capability out there to avoid being restricted in such a way, that people will simply circumvent the way that they're being restricted. That's pretty much the way that nature does things you know if it can't get over it around it or whatever it just diverts its direction and 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 goes until it needs to turn and can turn and then it will and that that's really like the the goop that we're all in right now you know it's like the whole market has been liquefied and it's all back down to personal interest personal values only that that message hasn't quite gotten to everybody yet. And when it does so, I, I believe that the vast majority of people, when they fully understand how low the barrier to entry really is, will stratify the market in entirely unanticipated ways. Some of them good, and, and some of them will be bad. Fortunately, the internet allows us to participate in pretty much all of them. And so, if we find people that aren't doing what they say they're, they're going to do, you know, they're doing some sort of fraudulent behavior, they're conducting some sort of criminal behavior. If that happens, we can pull stakes. We can take the ball to another court. We can play with other kids that are willing to play according to the rules that they establish for themselves. And it is with that that I'd like to close out this episode. Thank you very much for listening. I certainly do appreciate the support. We will be back again on Monday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And so until then, I want y'all to trade safe. Do your homework. And watch out for your own bunghole because nobody else is going to do it for you. Certainly not anyone at Davos. And so as far as what our last dance for the evening is going to be, hmm, I think this one is kind of appropriate. Suicidal tendencies, hearing voices, last dance here on Coin Metal. Thank you again for listening, and you all have an excellent weekend. Good night.